Please open your Bibles to the book of Isaiah. We'll be looking this morning at Isaiah 53. Please let's pray together. Father, we come to you this morning. We humble ourselves before you. For as we do, you promise us that you will lead us and that you will teach us. And, oh, Lord, we need to be taught. You tell us, Lord, to hide your word in our hearts that we might not sin against you. You tell us, Lord, that your word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. And we do, Lord, take your testimonies as our inheritance forever. So this morning we ask that you would open our ears and our minds and our hearts that we may learn from you. We ask you, Lord, to bind the enemy from this place. We ask this morning to die to self and ask you, Holy Spirit, to fill us afresh and anew and continuously. For we come to you in the name above all names, Jesus Christ. Amen. On Wednesdays, we've been looking at a bit of history, a detailed and accurate historical account of how our Lord suffered for us and why he suffered for us. This historical and accurate account was written 700 years before Jesus went to the cross. There are some that question the efficacy of teaching the Old Testament. Some who question the efficacy of teaching the Old Testament on a Sunday morning. There are consultants who will tell you that if you want to draw a crowd on Sunday, don't teach the Old Testament. And don't teach Revelation. And don't talk about prophecy. Well, to me, that's kind of gutting the Bible. Paul told the elders of the church of Ephesus that he had not shunned to teach them the whole content of God's word. Jesus quoted the Old Testament more than any of the Bible writers and they quoted it a lot. We know and we believe that Jesus and his life and his ministry and his sacrifice on the cross which defeated sin and his resurrection that defeated death were the fulfillment of prophecy. I think we need to know that prophecy and where it occurs is in the Old Testament. To the Christian, understanding the Old Testament is very simple. There's a lock on it to the non-believer, but to those of us who have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we know the key. The Old Testament is all about Jesus. Jesus said this is recorded in Luke's gospel. Then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was with you, 
that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. So although the Old Testament might be difficult to understand for those who don't know Jesus, for us who proclaim the name of Christ, it is clear. During the last couple of Wednesdays, we talked about Isaiah 53. This is a Old Testament verse that my cousin's son-in-law, the rabbi, never teaches because it so clearly speaks of Jesus. Isaiah 53. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid the iniquity on him of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people. He was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many, he made intercession for the transgressions. The story of our Lord on the cross for us in Isaiah, in the Old Testament. The past couple of weeks, we've looked at this statement as he was a root out of dry ground. Jesus grew up in Galilee. It was the Galilee, at that time, the Galilee region 
of Roman-occupied Palestine. In respect to spiritual, political, and standard of living matters, it was indeed dry ground. But God and did bring the most wonderful things out of dry ground. We come from dry ground. But through Jesus Christ, we are drawn into the kingdom of God. We saw that Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Jesus knew sorrow and grief so intimately that he could be called a man of sorrows. Because Jesus felt sorrow for those he saw around him and for the fallen, desperate condition of humanity. We talked about the reason that our Lord chose to humble himself to become man and even humble himself unto the cross because surely he has borne our griefs, our griefs, our sin. And yet Jesus himself invites us to surrender all of ourselves, our sins, our transgressions, our iniquities unto him and to put on his yoke, to pair with him our journey. He says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus, Jesus who born, has borne our griefs, invites us to be yoked with him, invites us to allow him to lead us through life, He wants to be part of our lives. To come to him in everything through prayer and supplication and thanksgiving that he might give us the peace that passes all understanding. We read that he was wounded for our transgressions, that he was bruised for our iniquities, and that by his stripes we are healed. We saw how the Holy Spirit allows the prophet Isaiah to see through the centuries, even to know that the Messiah would be beaten with many stripes. We read from the Amplified Bible in verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our guilt and iniquities, the chastisement needed to obtain peace and well-being for us was upon him and with the stripes that wounded him we are healed and made whole we read about this substitutionary sacrifice in second corinthians 5:21 for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And from Romans 3, verses 25 and 26, whom God has sent forth, talking about Jesus, propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that we might be 
just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. We learned that Jesus is at the same time just and our justifier. We lamented with Isaiah that all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to our own way. The prophet here describes our need, our absolute need of the Messiah's atoning work. Because sheep are stupid. What, what did Solomon write? He who loves instructions, loves knowledge, and he who hates correction is stupid. That word again. That we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned against God's way. We've made ourself, we've made the direction of our life that we've made for ourselves. Doesn't that mean we've made ourselves God? And there is but one God. And one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. We read in verse 7 that he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Despite the pain and the suffering of the Messiah, he never opened his mouth to defend himself. He was silent before his accusers, never speaking to defend himself, but only speaking to glorify God. Pilate asked him when he didn't give a defense. Pilate, seeing the injust, injustice of the Jewish leaders, asked Jesus, do you answer nothing? See how many things they testify against you. But Jesus still answered nothing so that Pilate marveled. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. When Isaiah uses the phrase that Jesus was led as a lamb to the slaughter, we should not take this as indicating that Jesus was a helpless victim. Nor were it the circumstances, this coming together of common ground of the Romans in the Jewish establishment. On the contrary, even in Jesus' suffering and death, Jesus was in control. Isaiah's point is that Jesus was silent, not helpless. He was not weak. He chose to be meek. We read of the Lord's meekness in John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. Therefore, my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me but I lay it down for myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. So let's start this morning with Isaiah chapter 53, verse 8. We read, he was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. 
He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? This not only refers to the confinement of the Messiah before his crucifixion, but also speaks of the fact that the Messiah, Messiah in his human form, despite what authors such as Dan Brown say, had no children, no secular children. But he has children of plenty. They are you and I and all who believe. In 2 Corinthians 6, 8, 618, Paul is quoting from 2 Samuel, where the Lord tells Samuel, I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord. Through Jesus Christ, through his work on the cross, through our acceptance of the gift of faith, through his grace, we have become daughters and sons of God. For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people. He was stricken. This is the first indication in our chapter that the suffering servant of the Lord, the Messiah himself, would die. Up to this point, we might have thought he would only have been severely beaten. But there is no mistaking the point. He is to be cut off from the land of the living. That Jesus would be willing to die for us out of love tells us of the sacrificial nature of God. Romans 5.8 for God demonstrates his own love toward us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Remember, God who is love and tells us how he loves and tells us how we ought to love must be the example of our loving relationships with the Lord, with our families, with our friends, with those that we don't know, and with those who have done us harm. In John 1334, Jesus commands, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. In Ephesians 5.25, he speaks of marital love. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And Christ died for his church. And Christ suffered for his church. And Christ put, put the well-being, the eternal well-being of everyone in this room above his own. Can we look at our relationships with others, with our family, with our friends, with the passing acquaintance, with our enemies, and say the same? The love to which we are to aspire is that same godly, sacrificial love 
And we are to be known by this. We are to be known by this. That by loving one another, people will recognize us as being in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Jeffrey Grogan wrote, the phrase cut off strongly suggests not only a violent premature death, but also the just judgment of God, not simply the oppressive judgment of men. This, among the many aspects of this prophecy, demonstrates again that Isaiah cannot be speaking, as the rabbis would tell you, of Israel. Although Israel, although my people, have suffered as prophesied over the centuries. This is not speaking of a people. This is speaking of the second person of the Godhead, clearly speaking. This may be the most detailed description of Jesus on the cross. I was rereading Isaiah 53 yesterday and I almost had to pinch myself to remind myself that I was reading the Old Testament. And speaking of Israel, We have some who proclaim the name of Christ who say that the church has replaced Israel. Read prophecy. Read Revelation. Read those sections of Old Testament. In Daniel, for instance, that's quoted by Jesus. The church is the church. Israel is Israel. To say that the church has replaced Israel in God's irrevocable covenant is to say that God doesn't keep his word. And to me, and I hope to all of us, that is blasphemy. The prophet brings the point home again and again. The servant of the Lord, the Messiah, suffers but not for himself, but for the transgressions of his people. Think of your own life. Here we have the sinless Jesus on the cross, Jesus who had chosen to suffer the pain that's not uncommon to men. Think of the sins you've committed in your life that put Jesus on the cross. And the sins that you continue, that we continue. But think of you yourself, that you continue to commit that put Jesus on the cross. And imagine, imagine the sins that you will commit that put Jesus on the cross. Think that if you were the only one in the history of mankind who had ever sinned, think this of yourself, you were the only one, Jesus would have gone to the cross. He loves you that much. Verse 9. And then they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Jesus died in the company of the wicked between two criminals. And it was the intention of those supervising his execution to cast him into a common grave with the wicked.
but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Despite the intention of others to make his grave with the wicked, God allowed the Messiah to be with the rich at his death, buried in the tomb of a wealthy member of the Sanhedrin named Joseph of Arimathea. As you uh, stand outside of Jerusalem, outside of the walls of Jerusalem, on the road that is now the road to Damascus and was in the first century the road to Damascus. If you kind of block out in your mind the Arab bus station and the mosques on either side of it, you will see a hill. And in this hill is the shape, unmistakable shape, of a skull, Golgotha. Is this the place that formed the backdrop to Jesus' crucifixion? I don't know. It was on a public road. The Romans chose to use crucifixion, this horrible, sometime days-long, torturous form of capital punishment to educate their captive populace that uh, this too can be yours if you don't follow our leadership. They would put it on a main highway in the road to Damascus. Same road a fellow named uh, Saul of Tarsus was to use a couple of years later. Um, is it described as the place of the skull, as Golgotha? Yes. Joseph of Arimathea and his companions had not much time to get Jesus buried because at sundown the Sabbath of the Passover would start. So we suspect that this tomb was adjacent to the place of the skull. Again, if you go today to Jerusalem, there is near this a garden that the archaeologists have said was in existence 2,000 years ago. And there is a cistern, two cisterns, one for wine, one for water, both of which have been dated to more than 2,000 years ago. And in the side of that hill is a grave. Graves in those days of the wealthy were in caves. And the cave had a shelf, or more than one shelf, leveled off. And the body was placed there until it uh, was desiccated to nothing but bones, which may be retrieved and put in an ossuary. But the round door to this cave, massive thing, uh, traveled in a downhill track hewn out of stone. So it was easier to close it off. To push it back would take many people. And the door to this cave of this rich man in this 2,000-year-old garden next to a hill that has imprinted on it the shape of a skull has clearly been used, but to this day, the door is open. The good Scottish clergyman who take care of this place, have put a simple wooden sign there. Excuse me, because every time I've gone there and seen it and prayed, 
I've cried. It just simply says, he is not here. He is risen. So Jesus had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. This is important. It shows that even in his death, even in his taking the transgressions of God's people, the Messiah never sinned. He didn't sin when he was beaten beyond recognition. He didn't sin when he was spit upon. He did not spin, sin when the crown of thorns was laid upon his, on his head. Thorns so sharp that when you touch them, when you, with almost no pressure, it draws blood. He did not sin when his back was rent open with leather whips embedded with pieces of pottery and rock. He did not sin carrying the cross to Golgotha. He did not sin upon the cross. Instead he said, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he knew that his place of burial was temporary. Because on the third day, and he had told this more than once to his disciples, that on the third day he would rise. And he did. Jesus suffered as man would suffer by his own choosing. But he suffered something even greater. We serve and we're created by a God who is one God, who exists eternally as three persons. We sang about holy, 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 about our God being almighty, about the Trinity. So forever, Jesus and the Father had been two persons of one entity, the Creator, the one who is existential. He told Abraham, I am. And there on the cross, because of our sins, because of the horror and abomination that those sins were to the Father, for the first time in eternity, the Father turned his face away from the Son. That never has to happen to us. We hear that hell, with all its burning, with all the suffering that we understand to be there, the most horrifying aspect to me, and I would hope to everybody, is that being in hell is a, experiencing the total absence of God in your life. And yet Jesus was even willing for a short time to experiencing that because he chose to took our horrible, disgusting, abominable sins upon his shoulder. And this, I would posit to you, is love. I think in closing, two things. 
One, and I apologize for repeating myself, but it's become an issue within Calvary Chapel, that the Old Testament is worthy of your consideration. And I would suggest that as you're spending time, whatever time you have dedicated, for me it's the morning, I can think of no better way to start my day than starting it with the Lord. Now I'm an old retired guy and I don't get up until 5.30. But when I was working, I worked in the construction industry and we got up considerably earlier than that. And I came to the Lord while I was working and it caused me to, instead of getting up at 4, to get up at 3.30. I never regretted that because I could open my Bible, I could open his word, I could pray to him. And the time went by really quickly, but it certainly changed the outcome of my entire day. So I would suggest to not be afraid when you read something in the New Testament, when you hear the Apostle Paul or the Apostle Peter or the Apostle, Apostle John or the or, the, or Jesus' half-brother James, or Jude, refer to the Old Testament, just take a little bit of your time and go back to the Old Testament so that you're reading some of both each day. And the second is, we're a faith of love. Because our God loves us. We will live eternally, every one of us, everyone who has ever walked the earth. So given that, the only question, as the real estate agents have often told me, is location, location, location. And if there's anyone here who's not sure of what that location will be, if there's anyone here who has turned away from God, God says, all you who labor and are heavy laden, come to me. Simple thing. We acknowledge in our hearts that God, what God sees in us, that we are sinners. We repent, we turn from these sins. And as we humble ourselves before him, we ask Jesus Christ to come into our lives as Lord and as Savior. Because God is unwilling that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And if you want to get to hell, you've got to step over the crucified body of Jesus Christ. Please let's pray. Oh Lord, thank you for teaching us, Lord. Thank you for causing these 66 books to be written, Lord. And thank you for giving us the opportunity to read them. And Lord, thank you that these words are living, that as we read them each day, they apply to whatever our situation is. And Lord, as we hide them in our hearts, we are able to take advantage of you who dwell in us. We rejoice that you who are in us is greater than he who is in the world. So we thank you, Lord. We thank you that we might be convicted and comforted, that we may be saddened and joyful at the same time because we know that at the cross, your holiness and your mercy come together. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.
Please stand.